All right, so what, what I've got, what, what we should look at here, let's break down what we got out of this, out of codica.com. We have all of this uh, here, there's doc type HTML, all of that. So it created the basic structure for us already. That's good. One thing here that I'm noticing, notice it says doc type in capital letters. There's a school of thought that people will argue for both sides is it should be capital, should it be lowercase. I believe I read that the specification should be lowercase, but it shouldn't matter. Now we learned it lowercase, so we'll keep it lowercase. Question? Oh, that's Right, so we'll just put this back to doc type lowercase, and would it still work? We saw that it worked. <coughs> but to be consistent with what we've learned, let's keep it lowercase. HTML tag, head tag, meta tag. There's our character set, meta name viewport. Um, this one is slightly different than the one we wrote ourselves. We had initial scale 1. Notice how they wrote 1.0. That's the same as 1. So I'll just leave that alone, whatever. User scale will know. That one is what we wrote, and then, but it's missing one. It's missing one that we wrote previously for full, you know, scale compatibility. Does anyone remember that one? Maybe there's a width in there. So let's go ahead and add that one. We are gonna have to change some of their code here and there, make it better. Line five. At the end of the line five, we got initial scale, comma, user scalable, comma. Don't forget that comma. We'll write width. W i d t h equals device dash with. We saw that it worked without this, but we want to be the most specific because this is how computers work. If you're not specific, there could be defaults that get in your way. You know, there could be a problem from omission. So with equals device with. Next are two meta tags that I didn't talk about that are not going to be necessary at a certain point. Meta name Apple Mobile Web App Capable and meta name Apple Mobile Web App Status Bar Style. One is set to yes, one is set to black. If this was going to be a web app, which it will be, and if it was on a real web server and someone visited victor.com on their iPhone, the iPhone would recognize that meta tag and treat it more like a mobile app, which was going to be Apple's sort of like um, halfway standard between a regular old website and a real app. But more and more people are not bothering in creating a real app. So this pair of meta tags isn't as relevant as it used to be. I'm not going to remove it for the moment. We will a little bit later, but that's what those two are. Basically, specifically focusing on Apple devices. And, you know, I've got a Windows phone, you probably have an Android. It's just going to ignore it. So it doesn't matter if it's if it's in there or not. Yeah, because one does one thing, one makes it web app capable, and then one defines what kind of status bar style. Black or white or transparent, I believe. Then we've got a title title is empty. Nothing was written in the title. But if you notice, um, if I do view it in the browser, up in the <coughs> tab, it says header. The default behavior is that what is written as our very first heading tag will be put up on the title, especially if there's no title defined. That's what this did here. No title is defined. If I wrote, if I write hello world, did you see that it wanted to be hello world for a moment? Let me refresh it again. 
you see hello world for a moment. And then what takes over is the very first heading. That's why they left it empty. And that won't matter anyway eventually, because this is going to be an app and there are no tabs when it's an actual app. You know, there's no web browser tabs when it's the actual app. There's a couple of empty blank lines here for some weird reason. I'm going to delete those. This will probably throw off a lot of people's line numbers. But I'm at number line 8 title, 9 blank, 10 link. <coughs> there's a link rel style sheet. It's linking to a style sheet. It's linking to an online style sheet. Oh, there's jQuery mobile. So it's linking to the jQuery mobile CSS file. It's linking to it at a different website. We previously linked it to code.jQuery.com, and here it's going over to CloudFrontNet. We'll leave this alone for the moment. We'll come back to it, because this is also jQuery mobile 1.3. And we have 1.4. something. We'll fix it in a moment. But there's a style sheet. 13, link rel style sheet. There's another style sheet here. This is a local style sheet. That's that codica.external.css. The one in the folder that is empty waiting for us to write uh, to write there. So we'll use it later. jQuery and jQuery mobile. So again, CDN online versions of jQuery and jQuery mobile. Here it's got 1.9 and I think we did 2 point something last time. We'll fix that later. There's the jQuery mobile 1.3 again. We'll fix that later. There's the external... Oh, this one's interesting. It's pointing over to the Kodika external.js file on their server rather than the one locally for us. We will change this one right now, actually. Line 20, which should be the Kodika file, change that so that it simply says kodika.ext.js. It's actually easier, I think, to say external than ext. Sometimes I call it extra. That's even faster to say. I don't know what it stands for. Probably external. kodika.extra.js. Whatever that was referencing on the other file doesn't matter. We're pointing it to our own in our own local project. The head section then ends, then the body section starts. There's a comment there. There's a comment up here too. Home. This is our home section. Div data role page, ID page one. Well, data role page is correct, and ID will fix that, but div is not. As a matter of fact, if you double-click div, it'll highlight it in multiple parts throughout your document, which we need to fix. This is the old way. We need to use the way that we've been learning. Sections, articles, and so forth. We'll fix that right now, but let me show you this. Try this. Double-click div and press Control F. Control F is the same as going up to Edit. Where do they have it? Search. Find. Control F. I double clicked. I selected something in the code. I did Control F and it pulls up my find with the last thing I selected. Just a little basic thing that will be very useful as we go on because we're going to have eventually hundreds of lines of code. And instead of wasting our time about scrolling and scrolling and scrolling to find the right section and going too far and coming back and trying to search, we have find. The computer, in a millisecond, can scan your 500 lines of code and find the code that you need. So let's say later on we have an ID over on line 1000. We have a screen called contact. And on line 1000, it's ID equals contact with find that could help us very quickly get to line 1000 if we didn't know that it was in line 1000. We'll see real examples of this eventually but if I do something like ID equals quote contact find 
that would very quickly find me on line 792, where I need it to be. And I'm going to be mentioning it because I want to save I want to save you. I want to help you. I want you to not get carpal tunnel syndrome from all of that scrolling and scrolling and scrolling to find your code. Control F to jump to the place quickly. Find. What we can also do under this find box, we can match case and do regular expressions and all of that complex stuff. And then we can also do, just for fun here, div count. There are 35 examples of the div tag throughout my document. 35 generic containers throughout my document. They're not all wrong, but they're not enough of them are right. If I have more than one document open, find all in all open documents. So it'll search through all my open documents to find what I'm looking for. Find all examples in my current and close. Notice if I click elsewhere, this becomes transparent, which then you can play with that. <clears throat> I've got find, replace, find in files, mark. This is way more powerful than the plain old find. Replace, we'll be using that a little bit later. We can't quite do it right here, but this would be perfect where I would go something like replace div with section. But we don't want to do that because it's going to replace 35 instances of div with section, and they're not all sections. But there will be a lot of times when this find and replace will be amazing. Let's say I had something that was like id equals, you know, page, page 1, something weird like that. We then needed to replace all of that with the more sensible, you know, my page. We do replace all and everywhere throughout the document it will replace that. Maybe I select a chunk of code, I activate this. Within the area that I selected, replace everything there, instead of throughout the whole document. So let's just say this. This is jQuery 131 jQuery 145. Don't do this. But everywhere throughout the document where the wrong version of jQuery is, I can quickly replace it. These examples that I've given, we can't exactly do them right now, but we will see to do those later. So you can close that find box. Um, what we need to do Line, if you if you click on line 25, it should highlight the opening div. You'll see the red line. You should see it go basically all the way down to the document to line 119. In my case, line 25 and 119 are where the pair that I need to replace. This is one screenful of content here. So what are, what tag are we using for a screenful of content? section. So let's do this. We need to replace on line 25 that div, which is the data roll page. Change that to section. And go down to its pair. If you still have it highlighted, it'll still take you back to the to the pair, which I wrote down was, in my case, 119 slash section. Section slash section. While I'm here, the very last thing that I see, data roll footer with a div, which is wrong, which should be what? Footer. So at about line 114, and its pair at 118 footer. Let's do that. Footer slash footer. It should highlight both.
Um, this is also showing a heading 3 rather than what we want to do of a heading 4. So change that out to heading 4. Line 116, or 115, should have the heading 4 pairs. Now, it might not make sense at the moment, but what I want to do is I want to remove data theme A. I don't want to comment it. I want to remo remove it completely before we do that. Data theme A is the default theme. If we don't specify a data theme, it assumes A. So in a sense, this is a little bit of redundant code. I'm curious. I can go to my find and count. There's only two examples of it. That's a few bytes that I could sh that I could uh, that I could save, but I don't want data theme. Um, used actually, I just uh, I want to keep it as a default. So I want to remove this in all instances. So this will be an example here where we can use find and replace. Let's do this. Select data theme A. Don't forget the opening and closing quotes. Depending on your color scheme, the highlighting might be obvious or not. I want to select data theme A, quote, end quote. Hit control F to bring up find. And then at the top, go up to replace. Find what? Data theme A. Replace it with what? Nothing. And if you hit replace all, everywhere where data theme A was will get removed. In this case, only two examples. But if we had a lot of them, everywhere throughout my code that got removed. Let's back up all the way to the top again. Go back to the top of your code at about line 20, 26. At line 26, I see a div data role header. It starts at 26, and in my case, goes to 50. So just want to make a note of that, 26 to 50. 26, data role header. It shouldn't be a div, it should be a header. So change your line 26, header. And then line 50, slash header. Backing up to line 27, that's set to heading 3 as the first header. What should it be? Heading 1. Oh, before we go further, I was about to forget here. Section data role page, page 1. Let's change that to ID home instead of page 1. This will be our home screen. Header, data role, header, going on, div, data role, nav, bar, data icon, pos. We haven't talked about this one. Data icon, pos, or data icon, pos, data icon, position. The icons are going to be at the top of my nav bar. I could put top, left, bottom, right. If I open it up in the browser very quickly, I'm seeing if I have an icon, it's at the top of the icon. If I have data icon pos bottom, clearly it's at the bottom of the icon. We have left, we have right. You can, you can leave it as is, top, 
or you can change it to any any spot you want but what I would say try not to do left or right notice how much smaller the button is when it's left or right and eventually this is going to be on a device and as you started to use these mobile devices you probably realized how fat your finger was you never thought about it and now as you're trying to tap things your fingers too big and you're hitting other things if we make our our tap targets perhaps a little too small, we might miss and the user's going to click elsewhere. And they're going to get mad at you that they can't click it properly. So a little bit of user experience design right here. Don't make your tap targets too small. So I don't recommend the left or the right. Top or bottom. Notice how much that is much more clickable. That's going to be a bigger area for someone's finger to hit and it'll be proportional depending on the size of the screen. But this whole thing is a nav bar. We, we talked about creating a proper nav bar previously using the nav tag. So we need between 30, in my case, and 49. So that should be simply NAV nav, line 49, nav. It should, again, highlight in purple if you've got the default theme and a red line back to its pair. If it doesn't, you know, if, if it's not properly written on both, it'll just keep stay black and have no red line. It's one of the indi indicators that something was wrong. The color coding, if you've got my theme, should match. If yours is black, mine is purple, this is the correct one. Nav, data roll, nav bar, data icon pause, that's fine. UL, that's perfectly fine. This is an unordered list. LI, these are list items, that's fine home button and button well while we're here we have a home button the second button that'll be our art classes we could spell out the whole thing art classes this will be our computers so we should be seeing <coughs> there is a link a href it's a button data roll button basically because it's a nav a home button an art button a computer's button. And it wants to go to page one section, page one section, page one section. We have no longer a page one section. We have a home section. So the home button should have pound home. Eventually we're going to create a an art section so that it'll be pound art and eventually we're going to have a pound computers. section. We don't have one yet. If we try to click on it, nothing will happen or it might give you an error. But that makes sense because we don't have uh, we don't have uh, that section yet. If we look at um, further with the attributes, data, transition, fade, all three of them have a fade, which is a very boring animation, but it's fine. But I'd rather have a perhaps a nicer one. I'm going to go with flip. This could be an example about why that find and replace could be useful, although you might be able to make the change as I'm talking. So sometimes these things can be done very quickly, sometimes it's overkill. Here's one example. If I select fade, control F, switch to replace, flip. Replace all. Would that have been faster if I typed flip for all three of them? Maybe. It's only three of them. I know how to type, I don't know, 60 words a minute or something. I could have done it fast. If you're hunting and pecking, which is perfectly fine, it might have taken a little bit longer. So 
these are these little shortcuts that I'll be talking about here and there. So I undo that. That'd be the same as double clicking fade and typing flip. Double clicking fade and typing flip. Double click is also your friend here with the code because that lets you select a little bit of the code. It's pretty smart enough to what what you're trying to select. If I double click transition, it selected the word transition. If I double click href, it did that. I would have rather had it had done data transition. But oftentimes I'm setting data role, data transition, data button, data icon. Anyway, I'm going to go with the flip transition. You can do with whatever you want. We've done flow. We've done flip. We've done flow. I think there's one called turn. We have slide. I think we've also got slide up. If there's only a where, if there was only a place where we can look it up, and learn them all. But I'm going to keep it with flip. Hmm. These have a data theme set to nothing. It's a few bytes of code taking up space doing nothing. It's going to inherit. It's going to inherit data theme A. I feel I don't need those. So here's an example for find and replace. I'm going to select data theme equals quote end quote. Control F to bring up find, switch to replace, and then on replace with nothing. Just delete that. Nothing. It will replace spaces. Even though spaces are invisible, spaces are not nothing. Spaces are invisible. So if here you added a space, it will replace that with a space, which is actually useful, as we'll see on some examples. But here I have nothing that I'm replacing with. Curiosity, under find, how many of those exist? Just three of them. But I'll replace all, and all three of them quickly went away. And there still is an extra empty space that torments me, but anyway. Data icon equals home. I've added an icon to one of them, not the other ones. I need to look up some good icons for art. Is there like a paintbrush that I can put here? Uh, computers, is there like a little computer that I can put there? I have to go look it up on the documentation. Um, off the top of my head, there is a pencil, which they called edit. There's a little edit pencil that might be good for the art icon. And there is um, a gear icon that might be good to use with computers. Computers are mechanical to to some degree and a gear is mechanical so maybe that will work. Here is another one that works better. The catch though is if you go to jQuery.com and you put in one of the ones like navigation. Navigation at the moment won't work and it'll just put some generic weird icon because navigation is a jQuery 1.4.5 icon, and we've got jQuery 1.3. So eventually when we upgrade that to 1.4, these newer icons will work. So I'll just keep this as gear. The last thing is home has class, so that's CSS. Remember, IDs and classes are about CSS. UI-BTN-Active space UI-State-Persist. And that's a fancy way of saying this button is active. When this button, when, when I'm on this screen, this button is active. If I go to the art screen, eventually I want the art screen to be active. When I go to the computer screen, I want that to be active. Because if I didn't have that class, and they all look like this, unless I had some other indicator to tell me I'm on the art screen, a person would not be able to very easily, at a glance, tell what screen they're on. Have you used apps or websites that you don't know what you're looking at? You forgot what you clicked on? What am I looking at? What screen am I at? That's bad user design, bad user experience.
design. User experience is the whole big concept of how does a person use your app. We've had 26 years of websites. Um, and there's been many conventions that have, been, that have come around. Like the home icon now means home. Go back to your home screen. And something like this, maybe you're maybe it's making you think edit. You're going to edit something rather than, oh, it's related to art. So there's these meanings that have come up. And the meaning of an icon that is highlighted is that there you are. You're on the home screen. So that you don't get confused. So that's how that's, that's working there. Eventually, when we create the art section, I want my art button to be active when, I'm, when a user is there. So when we get there eventually, we're going to need to copy this little chunk of code, this class, over to the art <coughs> link to make it active. We'll do that soon. But what this is, that's jQuery Mobile. That's specifically jQuery mobile code. UI, that's their little marker, their indicator that it's related to jQuery mobile. So whenever we see in any code, if you browse other people's code, you ever see UI dash something, that's oftentimes jQuery mobile. So there's some jQuery mobile CSS that defines this to be active and to persist, meaning the color doesn't go away. Make the a Show the active color, in this case blue, and keep it persisting, keep it visible. Oh, that's part of the nav bar. Let's move past the nav bar. What else do we have? Line 51, data role content. Okay, that one's totally wrong. We need the proper tag instead of div, which will be article, and then we will need the role and the class. Let me make a note first. 51 is where the content starts, and that'll go all the way down to 113. <coughs> so make those article slash article. Article to article. We don't use the data role. This specification doesn't want us to use data role, even though it works. It doesn't want data role for the for the content. It wants role main and then class. I forgot. So we need to look it up. class UI dash content. Okay. I'm going to remember it one of these days. Class equals UI dash content. So change that over to article. Role equals main class UI dash content. This is perfectly fine. Heading 2 should be the first heading that we see within the content. Leaving it as heading, that's fine. We'll make it say something else later. Div style width, in my case. What is this? This is the placeholder image. This is just a basic image. Placeholder image, we'll leave that alone. That could be some code we'll use later to show some pictures. Line 58. That's our that's our map. We're going to create a better one, but this is a map, SRC. It's showing a picture. But what the cool thing is that it's dynamically going to Google and building a picture at that moment that someone loads this page. And if you kind of parse this code a little bit, it says, static map question mark center San Diego California so you can still change that if you don't want to go back to Codica this is where how you can set it to other locations just follow the format Los Angeles California 
then we have amp ampersand zoom 14 hmm what if I put 10 my map is zoomed out farther or closer one of the two let's put five smaller numbers zoom me out larger numbers zoom me in originally it was on 15 whatever it was so playing with their code Zooming me in more. So we have a parameter. This is right here. We're tapping into the Google Map API. We're going to look into this concept a lot more later. An API, it's an interface. It allows us to tap into something. Google is giving us an entry to one of their services. We, we feed it various parameters the center parameter the zoom parameter, the size. Here's a spot for me to change the size of this map. A marker, the marker, that little pin, that little pin that attack is still set to San Diego even though I've centered my map to Los Angeles. There we go, now there's a pin in the middle of Los Angeles. And the last one, sensor false. We're not tapping into the GPS sensor of the device. We can set that to true and with a bunch of other code then have it tap into the GPS of your real device to give you a real location. That'll be later. It's an image, it's got a width and a height. UL data role list view. We haven't talked about that one. Data role list view. It's right there. Divider, button, button, divider, button. The whole, this whole element is an unordered list. Bullet points again with a data role of list view. So the humble bullet points are upgraded to this cool looking widget this list view thing with rollovers and spacing and all of that, rounded corners, with list view. This has a data divider theme, B. Let's see, what does it look like with A? Black. So you can leave that data theme as B or set it to A or take it out, then it'll default to A. Save a few bytes, doesn't matter. I'm going to take it out. Oh, it defaults to B actually, it looks like. So if you do want the black dividers, you need to set it to list divider theme A. I'll leave it out anyway. Data insert true. I, we, we, I believe we, we did mention in inset. I think no, we mentioned inline data inline. Well, without me telling you first what it does, what if you change that? True false. False makes it like this that it stretches across the whole design. Now it kind of then got weird with the elements above it and below it, which we can fix, but inset false is that it's not inset. It's from end to end of the screen. You've seen that kind of design in apps, I'm sure, like in a in a uh, in an options screen, perhaps. I like it as, as true. like that. List item, data role, list divider, role heading. And then 
another one later here, list divider heading. So each one of these dividers, divider, divider, is set to it's it's a bullet point but with a data role of list divider and a role of heading and then a name then follow some other list items more bullet points data theme C href no link but it's a button button link clickable data transition slide In this case, I do want to also remove these data theme Cs. We don't get data theme C with jQuery 145 anyway, so this is not even really going to work. Perfect case example here, also for uh, find and replace. So I know that I'm going to get an empty space, so it's okay for you to select the empty space. It will count it. If I select the empty space and data theme, and go to find and replace, there is an empty space there. Replace with nothing, replace all, no extra space. So just because spaces are invisible does not mean it doesn't take space. Take up space. You could of course, you of course have to be careful because if you selected too far, what if you selected the empty space and went to the I as well and did the replace, well, now you've broken a bunch of tags. There's no L tag. There's an LI tag. It didn't replace this one, though. Why didn't it break that list item? So it follows there is data role. Not like I had up there, which was a data theme. I will change that. I will replace that data theme C to nothing. And there were three of those. So the button is a link, but it has simply a pound sign. It's not linking to anything. It's a null link. It's a dummy link. That's fine. It will link to something later. Slide, that's fine. In my case, then I also have another button that's linking to page one. I don't want that. So if your buttons are saying href pound page one, remove both of those. We have no page one. Another divider another button. I added a little number to my button. You see here there's a number 7. I did it in Kodika. I just clicked and typed it. Code-wise, look how that happens. Span, which is sort of like the cousin to div. We'll explain later. But it's at the class UI LI count. UI, meaning jQuery. LI, list item, bullet point. Count. So it's treating that bullet point basically like a number count. It's not dynamic. It's always going to say 7. But if I was programming this for like a social network and I wanted it to show that that was, I have 7 unread messages, that would require the JavaScript, which would be very complex for that to update as necessary. Next is a block of div class UI grid A. We're going to leave all these divs alone. In this case, this div is just fine, a generic container, because the grid is our, uh, is our, is our invisible grid. So invisible that you're not even going to see it in the design because there's nothing in it. It's, it's right there, but it's invisible. The way it works is we have first a class. This is one of the ones that uses class rather than data role. A class of UI grid A. 
that's going to be basically um, one uh, uh, the the two it's grid A is going to be one column. I always get that one confused. I believe it's one column. Then we've got a block. It's like a table. We've got rows and columns. And it would have been great if they called these UI row, UI column. I forget which is which. We'll see which one in a moment. But this is creating, I think, one column. Then we've got a cell, block A, block B. A and B together is my first row. Then I've got A and B again, my second row. If I wanted a third row, I would just create another div class A and B. So just to populate it, you don't have to do this, but within the two divs, I'm going to put something between the two divs, and what results is A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D. The first row, the second row. If I want to do the third row... Again, Kodika, you just click some buttons, it does it. Here's how it's working in the code. So if I copy A and B again, and this time put E, and F, a new row. I'll take it back. If I wanted a new column, that's confusingly where this comes in. UI grid at the top. UI grid A is, is, is two columns. It's based on the block as well. But if I put UI, U, UI grid um, B, then I would have a div class block C. Yeah, that sounds confusing, just like tables in the bad old days. C block. What does that look like? And there we go. A, B, C block, C, D. So I've made a, a new column. Change the grid to B and added a new block. All of this that I did, this is just informational. I will keep it as is it as it was. Simply grid A blocks A and B. And maybe I will put in something there just so that I can see it, because this grid is invisible until something is in it. So I'll leave it with a little bit of content. We have one more element, and then we'll take a break. Div data roll collapsible set. Divs will work fine here also. Uh, containers to display a collapsible set. These are like these drawers that open up. Each particular drawer is also a div pair with data roll collapsible. The whole thing is a collapsible set. And each row, each uh, drawer, is collapsible. And it's got a data collapsed attribute of false. So what that means is, right now, if I open up the document, well, let me show you specifically. Then we've got headers inside of each of them. There's our headers three that make sense this time. And if I were to add something like this, uh, box one, box 2, box 3. The, the odd thing is that you can technically do it like this. I'll explain in a moment, but it's divided into each particular collapsible, each one that has a heading 3, and then the content. I'm just going to quickly throw some content into it to show you that the way this works is like this, and the design is, is not so impressive with our current theme. But this is open. Box 3 is open. If I want to open box 1, hit box 1, box 1 opens, box 2 opens, box 3 opens, box 3 closed. All of these are closed now. Open, close. 
the default was, if I reload it, the third one is open. I want them all closed until someone clicks to open their choice to see more content. Because I can put a lot of content in these. Text, pictures, video, anything. Even collapsible elements, even, even list view elements in a collapsible element. Even a collapsible element in a collapsible element, if I want to drive my users crazy. And the way that works is simply put in content here. This whole thing is that drawer. What's written on the drawer and then content. <coughs> Data collapse false. I want these closed. On all three of these, I will set them to true. Have these drawers closed until someone clicks. Find them and replace good work here. From false to true. I've only got three of them, but what if I had 40 of them? This would definitely save me a lot of time. That's a subtle difference, but an important one. Now if I load it up, what we will see is all of these are closed until the person chooses to open one. Alright, let's take our second break. I'm going to put a version of my code up to this point now, in case you want this of what I've done all with at this point. I'm going to put a, a new version of this into the network folder. We'll take a break from 8.30-ish to 8.40, and uh, then we'll, we'll do some more. We've got to then now create sections. Everything's in one screen. I need different sections. We'll see some tricks for doing that. So we'll be back at 8.40.